If you would this morning turn back to uh, Shemot chapter 25, the beginning of our Parsha. Exodus chapter 25. And I say the same thing every week lately because it's true, not because I run out of things to say. But holy smokes, there's a lot in this Parsha. <laughs> and some of you may be going, well, like, what are you talking about? It's a bunch of figures and measuring. Like, could it be any more boring? <laughs> and to that I would say, well, bless your heart. <laughs> it may seem boring, but this is the instructions on building the house of God. And I don't mean like the house of God, like the churches we've all been a part of. This is the house of God. No, it ain't. There's, there's one. And what drives me absolutely insane, not to start out negatively, but just as a, as a jumping off point, is how we all live our lives and claim that we are the temple of, of God, of the Holy Spirit. And yet when it comes to Scripture talking about the details of what it means to build a place where God will live, we don't want to have anything to do with it. Almost like our attitude is that, well, we can just be however sloppy we want to be and God will still live within us. Can y'all tell this is one of my favorites? I, I know I say that all the time. It's one of my favorites. But this is, this is incredible. This is such, such good stuff. And let me say this. Um, I, I hope that year after year, after we, of reading the Torah portions, um, we are learning more and more about the commandments. That should be happening. Every year of reading through the, the, the Torah portions, through the cycle, we should be learning more about the history of Israel. We should be learning more about the patriarchs. We should be rereading those Sunday school stories again in a new light and, and digging deeper and deeper and deeper every year. We also, sh also should be getting more familiar with passages and verses and commandments that we've never maybe even read before. We should be reading new things every year. I was talking to a Jewish friend of mine this last week, and he said, how is it that after 45 years of intense study of the Torah, I still read it every year and see things I never saw before? And of course, he's studying in Hebrew. We should be seeing this. We should be seeing new things every single year. We also should be becoming, be becoming more familiar with the things that we learned last year. So while, while the challenge is every time we read through the Parsha cycle is to find something new and learn something new, there also is a, an opposite and equal challenge that we should be reminded of something we learned last year, but in a deeper level, so that we are gaining more experience, more, more understanding of the Scriptures. Part of that is... These measurements of the tabernacle. When it says so many cubits on the west side, can you picture that in your mind? Can you picture the north and south side and what that looks like in comparison to the east and west side? When it says to, to put the, the, the table of showbread, lechem hapanim, outside the partition and put the, the lampstand opposite of it. Didn't you picture that in your head? If you can't, this is not a jab at you, if you can't, then there are resources out there that can help you to do that. We know through Jewish tradition, we know through Jewish study, through places like the Temple Institute, places like Hatikva Ministries and Joe Good and Rico Cortez and all these people doing wonderful work, we know so much about what these scriptures look like. It's not just random measurements that we go like, well, I got through that, but I have no idea what it said. No, we can know. As we're reading through these things that seem like they're, they're just details and just boring, we can actually, as we're reading it, we can have pictures in our head. One of the things I love about the Humash, this uh, 
Art Scroll Humash is that, and you guys won't be able to see this in, in uh, particular, but um, you know that the Lechem HaPanim, the showbread, actually had a particular shape and a particular way that it was stored on the table? In the Humash, there's a diagram of it. Oops. We know exactly what it looked like. The menorah, of course, we've all seen a ton of, of pictures about the menorah, but we'd start talking about the sockets and the walls and the planks and the sockets and the, and the hooks and the rings and the, and it's just like, what in the world are we talking about? Well, look, here's a picture of it right here. See, you don't have to wonder. So what, it's, it's, like a, it's like a tenon, wood planks with two tenons, and then the sockets are two silver blocks with holes in them, and the plank slips inside. See, easy. We can begin to understand these things. They can become more familiar to us, not familiar in a way where we just start to read over, but in familiar in a way where we start to really understand. I talk about from time to time creating a world we can walk around in, and as we study the tabernacle more and when the temple more, we begin to start to see what it looks like in our minds, and we are creating a world we can walk around in. We can know what it looks like to walk up to the gate, to the curtain of the courtyard. We can know what it looks like to walk through that, court, that curtain into the courtyard and be presented with the laver and the altar. We can know what it, look, what it means to walk into the holy place and be greeted by the altar of incense and the lechem hapanim and the menorah. We can know what these things are and it creates this beautiful world that we can, that we can walk around in. And so that should be a goal of ours at each, each year as we read through the Parsha. The resources are out there. It's just for us to do it. Now, how important is the building of the tabernacle and these instructions? Well, you guys know because you hear me rant about it all the time. And I don't want to beat a dead horse this week. This week, I'm not talking about the details of the tabernacle. Even though some of you would like that, some of you would hate it. That's not what I want to do this week. But I do want to start out by saying how important it is for the building of the tabernacle that we not only read about the building and read about the details, but that we gain an understanding, that we gain a picture, that we gain a clarity. Do you know that the beginning of the, the commandments to build the tabernacle begin right here in Exodus 25? And they go all the way. Somebody guess, where do where the commandments, specific commandments about building the tabernacle end? Does anybody know? The end of Exodus? No. Somebody else. Numbers? <laughs> Too far the other way. Leviticus 10 is where this section concludes. So the building of the tabernacle, the instructions are from Exodus 25 to Leviticus 10. Now, I know you probably have to look in your Bible or look at your phone app to know how many chapters that is, but that's 26 chapters. 26, yeah, right. So if you have your Bible, find Exodus 25, and then flip over and find Leviticus 10, and I want you to hold that together in your fingers. Now, some Bibles are different, of course, because there's more commentary or less commentary or whatever, but just as an exercise, find Exodus 25 and Leviticus 10, and then pinch that together in your fingers and see how much of, of the, the Bible that is. 26 chapters, guys, is no, is, is no small thing. I would challenge anyone to find another subject that the Bible speaks about that is even half as long as the contig contiguous Instructions to build the tabernacle. Hint, there is none. Think of the things that are most important to us in our theology. Salvation, right? Kind of the big one. Not even close. What else? Uh, heaven. No, not even by a long shot. Sin. How many contiguous, how many continuous chapters of the Bible talk about sin? There's, there's barely like a couple of verses back to back 
in honesty that talk about. Now, again, not like these things are not important. They are important, so don't email me. They are important. Money, right? Well, the gospel, Yeshua talks more about money than anything. That's, yeah, absolutely. Because money was a problem in his day with the leadership in his culture. Do you understand that? Yeshua is not speaking about money universally for all, maybe for all times and all seasons, but in his day, in his, in the leadership, in his culture that we're supposed to be protecting this tabernacle, this temple we're talking about, that was one of the main issues. 26 chapters about building a place, building the place where God would live. Now, God tells Moshe to build him a tabernacle that he may dwell within what? Within them. Not build me a tabernacle that I may dwell within it. That I may dwell within them. Do you see when you actually start reading Scripture... How it corrects by itself without looking at Jewish commentary or Christian commentary, read, just being a good reader of Scripture, how it will correct what men have taught us. Just reading the Scripture for itself corrects anti-Semitism and anti-Rabbinic sentiment and anti-Jewish sentiment. Just reading the Scriptures themselves. Because you know what? The Scripture is not anti-Jewish. The scripture is not anti-rabbinic. The scripture is not anti-Israel. The scripture is not anti-Semitic. Men's version, men's teachings about the scriptures can be all those things. By saying things like, well, God dwelt in a building in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, he dwells in us. There's somebody who you should never listen to ever again because they don't read their Bible well. God did not dwell in a building only in the Old Testament. The scripture itself says, Moshe, make me a tabernacle that I may dwell with them. That I may dwell within them. So it's based off of this understanding. And I know most of us think this and know this already. But it's always good to come back and revisit this. And you guys know that I am biased towards sacred space and timbal, timbal, temple and tabernacle and, and all of that. And one of the reasons why I'm so biased towards studying tabernacle and temple is because, again, I have said and I have heard said my whole life that that's what we are. That's what we are. We are that. And I've, I've heard and said that my whole life. I've taught it. I've preached it. And I've also lived with the other side of myself going, I don't know how to be that. I am that. I believe that. But I don't know how to be that. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that means, what that smells like, what, that, what that's supposed to act like. I don't know what that tastes like to be the place where God wants to live. So God asks for a house that he can live in so that he can dwell in them, in their midst, inside of them. Now, you are not the temple. I am not the temple. You are not the temple. We are the temple. Yeah, but she's got stuff, and he's got stuff, and I got stuff, and they got stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah, but they smoke, and they dip tobacco, and they drink alcohol, and they gamble, and they smoke weed, and they watch pornography, and... Yep. Build me a house so I may live in them. You think every Israelite had it all together? Do you think every Israelite was following the Torah exactly? Well, just read the Bible. Obviously not. But God said, make me a place so I can live within them corporately. And all of the subsequent Torah is about keeping that place 
clean so that God could live amongst all of them. Because if God were to just live in you, God would not have a place to live. If God were just to live in me, he would have no place in earth to live. Does that make sense? Because I am not clean. I am not always the, the optimal place for Hashem to live. Well, God doesn't care. You see, he looks at you through Jesus. <laughs> We're going to talk about this in a second. But the bottom line is God is holy. Yes, God is merciful and compassionate and forgiving. But that does not take away from God's holiness and his unequivocal need and desire and deserving to live in a place that is clean. When you go on a vacation that you've saved money for and you've, you've taken off of work for and that maybe you're, you're only one in, in two or three years, you can stay in a roach motel. You can but there's a good chance you're not. Why? Because you deserve better. But the king of the universe can just come live in an old sloppy heart that just... I mean, yeah, who's really God? Just saying. So how do we handle this whole, well, if we're all the temple corporately, how does God live within us when there's so much ick, when there's so much uncleanliness in us? We have the pattern right here. Build me a place, keep that clean, so I live with all of you. And God has a way of keeping his body as a whole clean so that he can dwell amongst us. If God only lived in individuals, God would have no house. But corporately, he lives within all of us. Why? Because every year there's this day called Yom Kippur where you cleanse the house so that God may live in amongst everybody. And on Yom Kippur, this even today, God cleanses the body so that he may continue to live. Well, what about Yeshua? Yeah. God gave Yeshua to us so that the body may be cleansed so that he may live with all of us. Are you saying, Joe, that God doesn't live in me? No. I'm saying God lives within you because he lives within all of us. We are all an intricate part of the family. But you don't have a corner, and I don't have a corner on the presence of God. One thing Heather said about the, the revival thing talk we did last week, and thank you guys all for your, your positive feedback on that. Um, but I wonder how many pastors are going to get nervous or are getting nervous about all these, these revivals and prayer meetings that are breaking out, thinking that, that, that their support's going to go somewhere else. Their money's going to go somewhere else. Their members are going to go somewhere else. Oh, well, we got to get it here so that we keep our people. Or maybe we can do a new building fund or a new whatever. I know that's cynical. I know. It's, there are good pastors that really want the move of God. But nobody has a corner on that. What I, one of the beautiful things I love about what's going on around, you know, in college campuses, is especially beginning at, at Asbury, is that, you know, you could look at OAM and you could say, yeah, we, we don't have a big band, a big choir. We don't have a, you know, we don't have all that. So really, we, we can't really create a space for God to move because we don't have all that if that's what it takes. If it takes lights and fog machines and, you know, lasers and all the things and a survey that's perfectly put together and well ordered and there's never any technical difficulties or never any of that kind of stuff and if we had the best of everything then God would move well the thing that Asbury is hopefully teaching us is that it doesn't take any of that a piano and a guitar is about all they had and some 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 people that could halfway sing but it doesn't even take that it started with a 20 something minute devotion and kids going like, I want to submit. We don't have a corner on all this stuff. And so I want to talk about three things that the building of the tabernacle teaches us. This is really general. Again, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty. But just three kind of overarching things. So first of all, we have the beginning of the Parsha. Exodus 25 verses 1 through 9. 
Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel and let them take from me a portion from every man whose heart motivates him shall you take my portion. This is the portion you shall take from them, gold, silver, copper, and turquoise. That's techelet. That's this color blue on, that we wear on our tzitzit. Techelet, purple, argamon, and scarlet wool, which is uh, uh, sh uh, sheni tolat or tolat sheni. Um, linen and goat hair, red dyed ram skins, tachash skins, which you might have a bunch of different stuff. It may say seal. It may say badger. It may say porpoise. Um, one Israeli scholar even said uh, it could be unicorn. Like the, the word tachash, nobody knows, right? Nobody knows how it should be translated, which I think is really cool. Um, acacia wood, oil for illumination, spices for the anointment oil, and aromatic incense, shoham stones and stones for the settings, for the ephod and for the breast, breastplate. And they shall make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. Like everything I show you, and we'll talk about that in a second. So up until this point in the Exodus story, because this is still part of, this is still the Exodus story, right? This is still them leaving Egypt and becoming the people of God. Which, by the way, you know this already, but just as a, 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 a recap... Every time we read this Exodus story, we should be seeing our journey. The Jewish people, the nation of Israel, was not saved by keeping the Torah. They were saved well before they even received the Torah. So for all of our Christian friends and family and pastors and ministers and our own baggage that still sometimes wants to argue that, just look at the progression of events. God saved a people that he had not yet given the law to. And he only gave them the law when they said, yes, everything you say we will do. It required their submission before they had any responsibility. And as they come through the water and all of these things that have happened up until this point was all God's doing. God is the source. He is the one doing. He is the one moving. He is the one acting. He is the one taking care. He is the one doing all the things that Israel can't. Now, I know this doesn't sound like the story we have traditionally heard, but this is the story. God saves Israel and does for them what they could not do for themselves. Does that, does that not sound like the salvation that most of us experience, all of us experience? God saves our souls. He, Yeshua comes and connects us and regenerates us and restores us and does things for us that we cannot do for ourselves. That is the salvation story. That is redemption in a nutshell. And so all the way from, from the beginning of the Exodus, all the way now to nearing the end of the book of Exodus, this has all been God on display. It's all been Him being the Redeemer. And beginning in Exodus 25, only now does God ask the people to get involved. Yes, they had to be obedient. Yes, they had to walk. Yes, they had to follow directions. But God could have, this is something that's always amazed me. If God wants a house that he can dwell in, and it has to be so meticulously built and maintained, why did he not just provide it? Why didn't God just drop it from heaven? He could have. He split a sea. He filled the whole land of Egypt with frogs and lice. He darkened the skies. He rained down fire from heaven. He did all these other things. If the tabernacle is so important that it takes up 26 contiguous chapters, don't you think it would be much more like God to just go, you know what, I don't want you guys messing this up. I'm going to go ahead and provide it. But he doesn't. He says, I want you to make it. Wait, us? <laughs> I want you to make it. Because of what did you say, Dad? Participation. Participation. Remember, God calls us to partnership. And he says, I want you to take a terumah, a free will offering. Now, this is not a tithe. 
a tithe is you're going to give 10%. Okay? This is a truma, a free will offering. And I know in our background, sometimes we, we have trouble between tithe and offering and what, what, what. This is whatever your heart says you to give. And there is no condemnation whether you give a little bit or a lot. This is up to a person and their free will offering. God wants them to give in order to build the tabernacle, to build his house. This is about participation, and this is about the dignity of work. This is about the dignity of contribution. We in our current society, and this is not a political statement, this is just a statement of fact of where we are. The idea of work has changed in the last two or three years. The way we see work, the way we view work, maybe not us in our small community, but how many reports are you hearing of massive companies that are facing issues because their employees are going like, no, we're not coming back to the office. Sorry. We can do everything we do from home. We're not coming back to the office. Well, like, come back four days. No. Okay, three days. No. The idea, and that's for people that are working, period. There are historically more not working than have ever been before. And again, this is not political. This is facts. Our idea of work has changed. Which is why it's so fascinating that based on things like Parsha to Ramah and other passages, in synagogue, Judaism has always had a tradition that if anyone in the congregation needs assistance, there is a fund available for that. It is given in secret, but it is paid back. Now, some, most of you have not been on church staffs. Maybe you've not been real, real close to ministry. But can I just tell you the absolute hell that would ensue? If a church's benevolence ministry said, okay, sister so-and-so, you can't pay your light bill. We're going to pay your $200 light bill this month, or for most, $700 lately, whatever it's been. Um, but then you're going to pay us back. For some of you that have been close to ministry, close to, do you understand the absolute meltdown that would happen? I can't even express it, but I can feel it. <laughs> Why, why would Judaism be so lacking of compassion to help someone in their time of need and then require that back? See those Jews, it's all about money for them. They do it because they understand the dignity of work. They understand the dignity. And, and again, there's people that's listening that are, Legitimately disabled that can't work. I understand that. You legit, I, that, is all understood, that is all understood. What we're talking about is able-bodied, able-minded people that can work and refuse to. And I'm not talking about working a job only, a secular job. We're talking about building the house of God in the kingdom. People that can legitimately work in for kingdom purposes for building the corporate house of God and just refuse to out of fear or out of ignorance or out of just outright defiance and go, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. So I'll just sit back on my haunches and let it, let it go. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus paid it all so I don't have to do anything. And, and, and then some some doctrines reinforce this by going, oh, if, human get, if humans gets too involved, you're going to mess it up. Because remember, you can't be trusted. And yet God said, the holy habitation of the Shekinah, the, pre the very manifested presence of God, is not going to fall from the sky. You have to make it. I'll show you how, but you have to make it. There's a dignity in participation. There's a dignity in work, which is one of the reasons why I said, hey, we're going to plant some trees over there. By the way, thank you guys for all the trees, but you have to plant them because there's a little piece of ownership in that. There's a little piece. Of, look, I don't like planting trees. I don't like digging holes. I know no, probably nobody else does except Mr. Ricky because he's crazy. But 
He loves post hole diggers. I've never seen somebody love post hole diggers as much as that man. And they're yeah, the nine foot handles, but they're insane. But there's some ownership in that. There's some ownership in, in people volunteering to clean the building. And, and, and I'm not trying to equate this place with a tower. You understand, though, that we're talking about kingdom and the way it operates. There's dignity in participation and dignity in work. And on a personal level, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Certainly you have. You've all walked with God for a time. There are times in your life where there, are, there is sin that you cannot conquer. We all have it. Mine may look a little different than yours. Yours may look a little different than mine. But we all have, we all have a thing or a few things that we, to the best of our abilities, cannot conquer. It's just the way life is. And in those moments, maybe you've experienced God's deliverance from that thing. And the, the overwhelming heart of gratitude that you have, that awe that you have for the power and the compassion of God that says, stop struggling, my child, and let me cleanse you. There is nothing like that in all the world. There's nothing, and we can't explain it. There may not even be a formula. There, there is no formula to it. I know people write books and, and sing songs and, and preach sermons about, you know, three turnarounds and get your turnaround and, you know, spin around seven times and get your breakthrough and all that. There is no formula to it. But to be humble and repentant, that's the formula. And let God do what God can do. However, many of us have spent our whole lives waiting for God to do everything and when you start to realize this and you start to actually take control of your own life and go, you know what? There's some things that only God can do. But while he's working and I'm waiting for him to take care of those things only he can do, I'm going to get to work and work on the things that I can do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take control. I'm going to take that fruit of the spirit that we never talk about, self-control, and I'm actually going to change and do the work to become a better more person more filled with God's character. And the satisfaction that comes from conquering those armies in your life that have held you back, from conquering those, those, those that shame and that guilt, from conquering those destructive patterns that, that comes from cultivating good character and actually seeing it come to fruition because of what you did, it's not like deliverance from God, but boy, it sure is fulfilling and satisfying. And you know what? It's not arrogance or pride. You're not taking away from the power of the cross because you fixed something in your own life. That's crazy. You, if anything, we are, we are giving homage to the power of, of the sacrifice of Yeshua and the dwelling of the Spirit. We are, we are giving credence to the power of God that the gospel works. Studying scripture works. Worship and prayer works. It empowers us to conquer things in our lives. And when you start to begin taking self-control and conquering those giants that you can conquer, it just is like rocket fuel to your faith life. You start realizing like, oh, this is partnership. While God is doing what he's doing, I need to be at work too. Because I need to be the one creating the house where God lives. I need to be creating. I need to be giving. I need to be maintaining the house where God lives. That's something that I have to do. And if God is not dwelling in us, it's not God's fault. It's because we haven't taken responsibility. There is a dignity and a power in working and in giving and in partnership. Secondly, over and over in this Parsha, we hear this refrain. We see it in Exodus chapter 25, verse 9. Like everything that I show you. We see it again in Exodus chapter 25, a little bit later, verse 40. Oh, we'll wait. 
Let's go back before verse 40. Let's see, that's verse 9. Um, and then again in verse 22. Everything that I shall command you. And then again, we see it in verse 40. See and make according to their form that you are shown on the mountain. After every major section in Parsha Terumah with the instructions of the furnishings of the tabernacle, we have this phrase, exactly like I showed you on the mountain, exactly like the pattern, exactly like the tavnit, the blueprint, shall you do it. So let me ask you a question, which we alluded to before. If we want to be the place where God lives, how important is it that we worry about the details, that we focus on exactness, on precision, on intentionality? How important is it that we live life intentionally, that we speak intentionally, that we think intentionally, that we act precisely and intentionally concerned about the details of our speech and our thought life and what we do, our behaviors, our actual living. How important is that? Well, if we don't study the tabernacle and the temple, we have no concept of how important that is because God's this God. It's all like lovey-dovey and ushy-gushy and he's, he's, you know, Honey boo, and he oh, just wants to hug and love us and fill us and so sweet. And so it allows us this false belief that we can tolerate sloppiness. Now, what I'm not telling you is to put your hair up in a bun and wear sleeves down to your wrists and a skirt down to your ankles or whatever form of control you've come from. That's not what I'm telling you. If you want to do that, go with God. That's between you and him. I am not forcing on you a bunch of rules to say this is how, this is how we live a, a life that's full of integrity. If God, if you feel like the Father is calling you to wrap your hair, then you better do it. If God is calling you to wear a certain thing and dress a certain way, you better do it. You better do it so precisely and so rightly and so exact according to what he called you to that there can be no mistake. Understand what I'm saying. As believers... We cannot tolerate sloppiness in our lives. I don't know how much more I need to say except just to say it over and over again. <laughs> how much sloppiness do we tolerate? God says over and over and over, if you're going to be the place where I'm going to live, you better do it exactly. You better build it and maintain it exactly like I showed you. Well, but God hadn't showed me. Have you not read your Bible? This is, this is what the Torah is. The Torah is not only the building of the tabernacle, but it's also the maintenance of the tabernacle. So let's just get real. Sermon on the Mountie. How sloppy are we in forgiving each other? Probably amongst us, not, not too bad because we like each other. How sloppy are we in forgiving people we don't like? Mm. there's probably some dirty socks in the corner that you just never picked up. There's probably some clothes on the floor. There's probably some trash overflowing. That's how sloppy we are. How sloppy are we in our prayer life? Oh, well, now you're meddling. How sloppy are we in, in all, go, go, just go through the Sermon on the Mount and go, how sloppy am I? Because Yeshua is not giving general statements like love your neighbor. The understanding is love your neighbor as yourself, that is a precise call to action. 
That is a challenge of incredible precision. Because you know why? You are very precise on how you love yourself. You are very careful about how you love yourself. Talk about the hotel thing. We, you're very precise that you don't want to stay in a Roche motel. You want to stay in a, nice, a nicer place. You're precise about the clothes you wear. You're precise about the food you eat. You're precise about your entertainment and your relax and your all that kind of stuff. You are precise about how you live your life because it matters. So when you love your neighbor as yourself, that's not a general statement. That is one of incredible detail. We are to be as detailed as love, at loving others as we are ourselves. And yet we love ourselves really detailed and we love others sloppily. So how much slop is there in your spiritual walk? Before Hashem himself? How many things do you think, well, like, yeah, I can get away with this because God understands. There's grace and mercy. There's patience. Hallelujah. I mean, it's not like God's going to kill me and smite me, right? And, and, and he won't, Baruch Hashem. But is that any reason to let things go? There's a passage, and I didn't look this up. I can't remember exactly where it is. Somebody may know. One verse, I think it might be in, in Shira Shireen, Song of Songs, that says, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that sneak in and spoil the vine. Do we think that, well, I'll just take care of the big stuff, and then I'll let Jesus handle all the details? <laughs> well, Yeshua ain't your housekeeper. It's the little foxes that creep in and spoil the vine, right? So the building of the tabernacle teaches the dignity of work, and it teaches us that exactness in the dwelling place matters. Lastly, I want to read verses, uh, 20, chapter 25, verses 10 through 12. We're just talking about the ark. And what do we know about the ark? Well, the ark is, there's a lot to know about the ark. It's the, it's placed where? Where's the ark placed? In the Holy of Holies, right? That's the place where we all want to be, right? You talk to, to many, many believers, they think that's the place they live. Like, we live in the Holy of Holies, right? Um. But the interesting thing about the ark is that it's the place where God sits. It's the throne of God between the cherubim, the cherubim. Just like it is in heaven, surrounded by a heavenly host that sing his praises and honor all day and all night. Seated on his throne, that's, he says, Moses, that's where I'm going to meet with you, is right there. What's inside? The testimonial tablets? The covenant, the tablets of the covenant are inside the ark. He will write his law on our, on our hearts. Do you see the connection? Inside the ark is the law. And the prophets tell us he's going to write the law on our hearts, not on our hearts, on our hearts, minds. The innermost place in our lives, the, the law is going to be the same there as it is in the physical structure. Isn't God smart? What a show off. <laughs> this is what he says about the construction of the ark. They shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits its length, a cubit and a half its width, a cubit and a half its height. And they shall cover it with pure gold from within and from without and a crown all around. Could it have been enough that the ark just had gold on the outside? Whoever sees the inside of the ark, not even the Kohen Gadol sees the inside of the ark. The average Israelite doesn't see the inside of the ark. Who cares? Who cares what's on the inside? It could be rough cut acacia wood. Doesn't matter. Nobody ever sees it. But it's the place where the covenant, the evidence of the covenant dwells. It's the place where the Torah dwells. 
the words of life, the substance of our very being, the wisdom of God. Read Psalm 119 and all that it says about the Torah of God, that it is joy and peace and life and the source of all wisdom. And all the beautiful things that Psalm 119 speak about the Torah, that's what's inside the covenant, inside the ark, excuse me. And in order to be people with whom the Spirit of God dwells, we better be laden with gold on the inside and on the outside. I think Yeshua said something like, woe to those who clean the outside, but the inside's still dirty. Man, he's really making stuff, really good stuff up. No, he's not. He knows the Torah. He's a Jew that knows about the tabernacle and its furnishings. I mean, after all, the Gospels do tell us that he grew in stature with God and man. He did some studying. He knows some stuff. He's experienced the heavenly tabernacle. He knows what that's about. There is this, there is this understanding that if God has put his word in our hearts, in our lives, that it deserves the best it deserves, it deserves consistency between the outside and the inside. Are we consistent between the inside and the outside? And I know that many of us have been taught that it's all about your heart, and your heart is really all that matters, and that's just a lie. It's inaccurate. I'll be a little diplomatic. It's just inaccurate. Your heart is not the only thing that matters. It does matter what you do. So some of us have worked our whole lives on getting our heart right, but our actions stink. Because we think it, it only matters how we feel about something or how we think about something. I don't have to really do it. As long as I understand it and I feel good about it, that's what I get credit for. So we worked our whole lives on straightening out our heart and our actions suck. On the other hand, some worry about doing the right things, and yet their heart is not in it. They have no intention, no kavanah, and they think that's okay because my heart, I'm doing the right things at least. And the truth is that there has to be a balance of both. There are two terms that I think are really important when we're talking about this, and if I can find them. I want, I want to, to talk to you about them real quick as we, we close. We've got a couple minutes, if I'm going to be able to find them. There are, there are two ideas when we're talking about kavanah. Kavanah means your intention. The, 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 the posture of your mind and of your heart, right? So there is... This one called Maase Mitzvah, here I'm going to write these down so you can have them. Maase Mitzvah. Excuse my doctor's handwriting. I'm not a doctor. Maase Mitzvah is the external act of keeping a commandment. So you're like, here's what the Torah commands. I'm going to do that. And this is important. The other is called kiyum mitzvah. Maase mitzvah and kiyum mitzvah. And kiyum mitzvah is the actual fulfillment of the heart of the commandment. So this is something that Judaism has understood for a long time. You can actually do all the things outside gold, but you also have to couple that with an actual fulfilling in your heart and in your mind. Is this not what the prophets railed against? Like, stop slinging blood everywhere and repent, yeah. right? And there are four different stages, according to Rabbi Sachs here in the uh, Shalem, Koran Shalem, uh, Siddur. Number one is the, the first intention of our heart of having our inside match our outside is the intention to fulfill a mitzvah. This means that 
um, we don't just do things because we're commanded. We do things with a heart to want to do them. Are we just keeping Shabbat or do we long to keep Shabbat? And are we, are we cultivating that intention? The second is that we, that we understand the words of the commandments. So you can want to do something. But if you don't understand what the Torah is asking you to do, it can be hard, right? And so this is where study begins to come a thing. See, this is coding the inside and the outside. The third has to do with the context. How do I relate the context of the Torah into my, my time and my space? And the last is not just doing the things, but actually allowing it to change and have a meaning in your own life. So it's kind of a progression of intention. And what we're talking about is, 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 the, is cultivating these things and making it a purposeful thing that we do this. And so all the details of the tabernacle and building the tabernacle can be really overwhelming. This is big picture. And this is a hard lesson. This is a hard lesson. And thank God for his grace and his mercy and his patience. And he allows some slack, thankfully just like you do with your own kids. But you don't want that slack to carry on into adulthood, to carry on as they mature. You want them to, as my dad would say, you better tighten up, son. You better tighten up. And I want to tell the body of Messiah, we better tighten up. There's too much slack. There's too much slop. We wonder why God isn't moving, and maybe it's just because he's not here. <gasps> That's sacrilege. But maybe it's because we're not working hard to create a space where he wants to live. That takes work on our part. 